While largely forgotten over the 20th century, the beginnings of passenger air travel began with airships. It was the Zeppelin airships of the German Airship Travel Corporation that would be the first to carry commercial passengers and operate from a series of specially built airports across the German Empire. In 1909, these new airliners would take center stage at Zeppelin, after years of disappointingly few sales to the military. Count Ferdinand von Zeppelin himself, however, detested the idea, as he considered his airships a weapon to boost the capabilities and prestige of the German armed forces. While he had considered civilian applications for the airship decades earlier, years in the limelight and his rehabilitation in military circles had firmly shifted his views. However, the Zeppelin Corporation was no longer the small outfit driven by one unshakable nobleman that it had once been. The decision went before the board of directors, who decided in favor of the airline. The Deutsche Luftschifffahrts Aktien Gesellschaft was founded on November 9, 1909, with the hope of beginning operations in the summer of the following year. The company was quick to amass 3 million marks in starting capital and the backing of the famous Hamburg America shipping line, which would be the primary means of ticket sales and advertisements. Many larger cities soon sent requests to be included, with the mayors of Frankfurt, Cologne, Dusseldorf, Baden-Baden, Munich, Leipzig, Dresden, and Hamburg joining the airline's board of directors and seeing to it that airship sheds were assembled in their respective cities. While orders for commercial airships were placed, they proceeded to organize the first operations using the airship LZ-6 and the newly completed LZ-7 Deutschland. Deutschland was built along the same lines as the modified LZ-6, and was the first to carry passengers for the airline. It was a stretched design with a useful lift of 4,990 kilograms, with up to 1,496 kilograms of that being fuel. However, its real innovations were found in the once austere sightseeing cabin. The former canvas box was now a much longer comfortable sitting and viewing room, built from high layer plywood construction covered in mahogany sheets with mother of pearl inlays on its pillars and ceiling beams. The carpeting and comfortable wicker furniture added to the finery, and given the length of these flights, a small galley with matching aluminum cutlery was also carried. Lastly, it was the first to carry a purpose-built lavatory, built with aluminum to save weight. Behind all of this were a series of aluminum struts and cables which anchored it firmly to the hull. It was captained by a former Prussian airship battalion captain, Despite the several airships flown over the years, there was no sizable pool of experienced aviators to recruit from. The first flight would be to Dusseldorf, the city which managed to complete its hangar first. It was scheduled for June 28, with a passenger list of 23, mostly journalists invited to drum up notoriety for the service. The expectation was a flight of three hours, which began after a breakfast of caviar and champagne. Unfortunately, the crew had departed without a weather report. After the failure of an engine, the ship was left floundering in higher than expected winds. Deutschland struggled for hours through turbulence, violent gusts, and rain, with one officer making the mistake of telling a concerned passenger, we do not know what will happen. Captain Kallenberg was unable to prevent the underpowered, unbalanced airship from making a crash landing in the Teutoburg forest. Apart from a crew member who made a dramatic leap from the rear gondola and fractured his leg, there were no injuries. Understandably, the journalist's impressions were quite poor, and the airship was disassembled and shipped back to Friedrichshafen, where it would be rebuilt. Kallenberg was laid off, and in his place, Dr. Eckner became both a pilot and head of operations for D-Log. Eckner was an airship veteran who had been there when Zeppelin launched his first ship. His first action was to familiarize himself with airship piloting on LZ-6. He made some 34 flights, though this airship was soon damaged beyond repair after an accident in its hangar. With this accident, hopes were placed on the up-and-coming Deutschland II, rebuilt from the previous ship. LZ-8 was identical to its ill-fated predecessor and was likewise as ill-fated. With Eckener at the helm on its first passenger outing, he allowed himself to be pressured by the crowd to bring out the airship in a dangerous crosswind. Deutschland II was subsequently knocked alongside the hangar and bent out of shape. Eckener claimed this cured him of all recklessness thereafter, and he subsequently went to completely reform flight operations at D-Log. 
Dr. Eckener isolated the causes of accidents that had plagued operations thus far and focused on ensuring that D-Log airships would be crewed by veteran airmen who would have the benefit of extensive weather reports and more reliable equipment. The board was willing to give it another try and authorized the construction of a new modern airship. This new ship was named Schwaben, which was shorter, more maneuverable, had a useful lifting capacity of 6,486 kilograms and used new 145 horsepower Maybach engines which would prove far more reliable. It made its first and very promising trial flight on June 26, 1911, where it made for 75 kilometers an hour. Key among its innovations was rejecting the continuous lengthening of airships to boost lift and placing a greater focus on theoretical testing and problem solving rather than building a ship and continuously modifying it as difficulties arose. Along with the new airship came a series of reforms to D-Log's flight guidelines. Crew training was standardized, and captains in particular were required to have a thorough understanding of their vessels and to have participated in 150 flights before they would be allowed to command an airliner. The training program would be so successful that the military would send their crews to train with D-Log during their off-season. Some would even fly as passengers during the airline's regular service. These procedural improvements were to extend to the ground crews, both to improve the tricky process of moving an airship in and out of its shed and to avoid accidents such as the one which claimed LZ-6. In that case, an unmarked can of gasoline was thrown over a fire in the hopes of dousing it. Facilities were also overhauled and staffed with thoroughly trained professionals. Perhaps most importantly of all were the stations for meteorological reporting. Unlike Kallenberg, future D-Log captains would benefit from near nationwide weather reports from the series of meteorological stations, which captains could contact at any time over the radio. Even without the radio, they would have access to wind maps, which charted the typical currents over Germany and allowed captains to safely determine new courses should their first choice be unavailable. Should all else have failed, emergency depots were established along common routes, where airships could stop for repairs and fuel. With these improvements, Schwaben was well equipped when it began passenger service in the summer of 1911. With all the methods worked out and potential dangers addressed, passenger flights went off without a hitch. A typical flight saw passengers assemble early in the morning, when winds were at their weakest, and allowed them to see the airship as it was serviced and brought out. When they departed, the airship was almost impossibly smooth as it pulled away from the ground and began its journey. While the passengers traveled to a variety of locations and took in the view, they were provided with a series of refreshments. The meager provisions aboard Deutschland paled in comparison to what Schwaben's passengers enjoyed. Along with a considerable wine list that boasted a selection of Rhine, Moselle, and Bordeaux, along with Champagne, passengers were served a selection of cold dishes such as caviar, Strasbourg pâté de foie gras, and Westphalian ham. All this was enjoyed in relative silence, as the canvas skin and hydrogen cells dampened the sound from the propellers. The main attraction was to view the country from the air, as while this was a passenger service, its lack of fixed schedules could mean a wait of several days as weather cleared or repairs were made. Tickets, too, were steeply priced, owing to the limited number of seats aboard and high operating costs. A ticket could cost between 100 to 600 marks, depending on the destination, though many passengers didn't pay for their own seats, as they were invited to garner publicity for the service. Along with journalists, there were VIPs, such as notable public figures, and foreign dignitaries the state wanted to impress. Those unable to afford the price of the tickets often watched one of the many films made aboard the airliners or visited one of the many D-Log airports located across Germany, which often drew massive crowds as the airships came and went. In the several weeks following its entrance to service, Schwaben was a hit. After the miserable year of 1910, it seemed as if the airline had not only been improved, but practically perfected. As Schwaben was refitted following its stowage in the previous winter, it was joined by a slightly larger sister ship, LZ-11 Victoria Luisa. Named after the Emperor's daughter, its design and performance were nearly identical to the Schwaben, save for its redesigned elevators and rudders. The year would start well, though an accident would leave Schwaben burned on June 28th. 
It was traced to a static discharge caused by rubberized fabric which formed its hydrogen cells. No one was aboard the grounded airship, though the public was momentarily disquieted. To allay fears, the Dusseldorf maintenance team took the blame, while the company quietly shifted to the use of cells made of cotton and gold beater skin. This material was a finely woven cotton fabric laminated with chemically treated sheets of cow intestine, which, while unpleasant to produce, was lighter than rubberized fabric while remaining just as durable and removed any chance of static discharges. Apart from the loss of Schwaben, operations continued without trouble for the remainder of the year. Operations were expanded by a new airship, LZ-13 Hansa, named for the medieval Hanseatic League of Merchants which spanned the Baltic. Identical to the Victoria Luisa, it was completed July 30 and took Schwaben's place. For the remainder of the year, Victoria Luisa and Hansa operated out of the double hangar built in Hamburg, where at the end of autumn, they were used to train the first naval air crews. At the end of this training period, Hansa was flown over the High Seas Fleet Parade and the naval maneuvers that followed it. Ironically, Zeppelin's civilian operation had managed to capture the military's interest more so than any direct appeal. By the start of the 1913 season, D-Log was a sensation and a technological achievement of immense pride. Shortly after Hansa and Victoria Luisa had entered service, they were joined by LZ-17 Saxon. This ship, named for the region it would service, was slightly shorter than its contemporaries, though built with a wider diameter and held the highest lifting capabilities of the three. It was completed on May 3, 1913, and was sent to a shed at Leipzig, where it operated from thereafter. During the summer season, all three ships were in service, and each operated out of its own region. Hansa left Hamburg for Potsdam to service Berlin, and Victoria Louise was sent to Frankfurt. These regional flights would ensure the airships were seen over and around most of Germany's largest cities. What was once a curiosity that rarely strayed from the Bodensee was now a common sight for millions of Germans, one that stirred both patriotic fervor and curiosity and optimism for what the future held. While a relatively small proportion of Germans would ever fly aboard these airships, they drew massive crowds to the cities they visited and the sheds where they were stored. Sadly, the entire enterprise was cut short by the beginning of the Great War, and the airships were turned over to the military during the period of general mobilization. Practically overnight, D-Log ceased to exist, and in the end, it's difficult to know how successful D-Log would have been had it continued to operate its growing fleet of airships. When its airships were pressed into military service, the company was still operating in the red, though its operating costs were plummeting thanks to new facilities and cheap hydrogen production. Regardless of its financial forecast, D-Log's technical achievements would not be rivaled for over 20 years. That concludes our look at the glamorous, if obscure, beginnings of passenger air travel. Feel free to share your thoughts on these unique vehicles in the comments section. What do you think was lacking from the menu? As always, we here at Plain Encyclopedia appreciate your love and support. So feel free to leave a like and subscribe to know exactly when new content rolls out. If you'd like to buy us some fuel to keep us going, visit us on Patreon or via PayPal. Until next time, stay tuned and keep following our updates.